Hi, and welcome to another episode of Particle Physics Brick by Brick, where we're trying to explain as much of particle physics as we can through the medium of Lego. In this video, we're going to be talking about the charge of the strong force, otherwise known as color charge. Before we start this video, just a quick reminder of the forces of nature. Gravity is dependent upon the mass of the objects and is very, very weak. With particles being so low in mass, we don't really take this into account when we're talking about particle physics, even though it has an infinite range. Electromagnetism, which was the topic of a previous video, has infinite range and acts on things with electric charges. The strong nuclear force, which is what we're going to be talking about today, has a range about the width of a medium-sized nucleus, around 10 to the minus 15 meters. And the weak nuclear force, which is a topic of a future video, has a range which is about the radius of a proton. But as I said, we're going to focus on the strong force, and particularly what is meant by a strong charge. Now, in the electromagnetism video, we mentioned how electric charges are either positive or negative. And the fact that these two charges are opposite mean that they attract. Now, when it comes to strong force, the charge that's involved is a little more complicated. It can't just be a number, positive or negative, on a one-dimensional number line. That is because we can't explain the strong interaction very simply using just one number. We can't actually use just two numbers. We actually need three numbers, or three different dimensions, with which to explain the strong interaction. This means we can't use the one-dimensional number line analogy that Benjamin Franklin used to explain the electric charge. We have to think of something new. And for this, we go into the world of biology. Now, this is a diagram of the eye, but the only thing we're really interested in is the bit at the back called the retina. The retina is where the photosensitive cells that build up the picture of what we see actually live. And at the very central point, a point called the fovea, is where we have the greatest density of certain types of cells called cones. Now, cones are really important because cones are what give us our colour information. In fact, there are three different types of cones, not just one, and each of them is sensitive to a different colour of light. One of these cones is more sensitive to the blue part of the electromagnetic spectrum. One is more sensitive to the green region of the electromagnetic spectrum, whilst one of them is more sensitive to the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Peaks in each of these graphs tell us where each cone is most sensitive in the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's really these three cone cells which allow us to piece together all of the various different colours of the rainbow. Truly, we don't see the world in total multicolour. We only see it in red, green or blue. And we piece together the other colours through the amount of red, green or blue light that we see. Now, if we mix these three primary colours together and we fire all of the different cones, then we don't see any one colour. We see white light. Now this isn't the colour mixing you would be familiar with from art class. Art class uses paints which are pigments, and pigments subtract light and only reflect the colour that we see. Here, when we're talking about light mixing, we are talking about additive mixing. We're talking about layering one colour on top of another. And if you layer all three of the primary colours on top of each other, you get to white light, which is effectively colourless. And this is what we view as our neutral point when it comes to this colour charge analogy. Now, the three colours, red, green and blue, are known as the primary colours of light. And that is because they are the colours through which we see the world. When we mix the various primary colours together, we get what we call secondary colours of light. So, if we mix together blue and green, we get a beautiful cyan, which is the opposite to red. It's everything red is not. When we mix together blue and red, we get magenta. This secondary colour is the total opposite to green. It's everything that green is not. And when we mix red and green together, we get yellow. And yellow is the opposite to blue, because it's everything that blue is not. So now we need to think about our axes. So our axes are, as we said, not positive or negative numbers. They are actually colour axes. So we have a red, we have a blue, and we have a green axis. And when we go along these axes in certain directions, we pick up red, blue or green charge. And of course, there's got to be a negative, an opposite to these axes as well. So what is that? Well, we've got three primary colours, and in fact, the opposites are the three secondary colours. Let's just go back and think about it. If we mix green and blue together, we get cyan. And if you look at it, cyan is everything that red is not. 
if we mix together red and green, yellow is the opposite to blue. It's everything that blue is not in terms of color. And red and blue mix to form magenta, which is totally the opposite to green. And so these secondary colors end up being the anti-colors or the opposite versions of those colors, and therefore the negative sides of each of those axes. Now, just to convince you of this, I've got a quick optical illusion. Stare at the cross in the middle. Keep staring. Soon, you will start to see a green dot moving around. Now follow that green dot with your eyes. Is it actually there? I think you should probably find that when you follow it, the green dot disappears. The green dot is not actually there. What is there though is an absence of magenta because it's where a magenta spot is no longer seen to be. And so your brain fills in green where it sees an absence of magenta because our brain sees magenta and green as being polar opposites. And that is why in this analogy, the secondary colors of cyan, magenta and yellow are used to represent the opposite to the primary colors of red, green and blue. That means that if quarks can have red, green or blue primary color charge, then when we mirror those charges to create antimatter, then the antiquarks have cyan, magenta and yellow secondary color charges. Now this is true of all quarks. I'm going back to a slide that I used in a previous video. Um, and when I was explaining nature's building blocks, you may have been a little confused as to why the down quark is blue here, but in my picture of the neutron, there is a green and a red down quark as well. Well, this is because the color of the quark does not define what quark it is. In fact, all of the different quarks can be either red, green, or blue in color. And the same applies for the antiquarks. They can be any of the secondary colors of cyan, yellow, or magenta. That means that there isn't really only one type of up quark, but there are three, a red, a green, and a blue version. And the same with the down, red, green, and blue. And in fact, the same for all the different quarks in the standard model. Remember though, that the color is just an analogy. There's no real sense in which quarks are actually colored. They're far too small to have a color because they are smaller than the wavelength of red, green, or blue light. And so therefore, wouldn't absorb or emit those colors of light at all. And so the color is truly just an analogy. The thing that defines them as up or down type in my analogy is that I've put the up light quarks on top of the down light quarks when I'm building my particles. And we will follow this convention when we start building baryons, mesons, and antibaryons in the next video. I hope that this video's helped to explain a little bit about the analogy of color that we use when we're talking about strong charges for the strong force. From now on, I'm gonna call this color charge. And in the video on baryons and mesons, we will discuss how the color charge results in us building certain types of particles from quarks. Thanks for listening. If you would like to know more, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media for more information. You could also buy the book. Particle Physics Brick by Brick is available through online retailers and many local bookstores. Other languages are also available. If you follow this bit.ly link, you can also get access to lots of educational resources and information on where you can get your hands on LEGO to play along. LEGO is a registered trademark of the LEGO Group, which does not sponsor, authorise or endorse these videos in any way.